Okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture on BC 212. We're just continuing to answer some questions on Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Sean, go ahead with the question. Uh, when you see Genesis verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then verse 2, he goes on to saying that how the earth was formed. Mm. So when you read those verses together, it kind of seems like, you know, it's like this is the heading, like about God creating the universe. And mm. then you see how that process happens, is what you see. It didn't seem like, like this is created before, and then like then you go like further into creation about then you look at Earth. It kind of seems like this is the title. Then you have the story like that. Correct. It's like okay, what I'm like, you're right. Like he's saying, this is what I'm going to tell you about, and then he gives us step by step different things that happen. Yeah. So. Any other questions? Let me see online. So I just want to take up questions, okay? Uh, and Pastor, you say it's on the seventh day God rested, right? But uh, but then we know that God never rests. God always works. <laughs> what does it mean God rests? On? <laughs> so, God never tires. He never becomes weary, he doesn't tire, he doesn't sleep. And why it is saying God rested on the seventh day? So I think it's there, and this is my, my thought, that it is there more for our benefit. Right? So when it, go, when it says God rested, we have to understand it as not that God was so tired. Ah, I spent so much energy now. I need to regain my energy because God is infinite, right? So we have to, it's not from that perspective, but we don't understand it as God did finished his work and he paused. It doesn't mean he was not working, he paused. And he did it so that he could set us an example. That's all. I want you to pause. See, like when, for example, one day a week, and some places two day a week, and now Europe is saying three days a week. <laughs> we want to pause. <laughs> we want to rest. I mean, like, doesn't mean we stop breathing or stop cooking or, uh, you know, we are going about even on our in our rest day. We are going about our activity. It's just that we are not doing intense work. You know, on the like the other days, so God paused on that day, and He did it more for to set something in place for us to follow. We have to understand it like that, you know, not as um, He ran out of strength and had to recharge and things like that. Okay, yeah. Uh, like um, the question I was. Getting in my mind uh, is uh, like when we see God uh, made heaven, like one day each thing, right? Mm -hmm. So is it took the entire day to like when God spoke, let there be a light? Is it took the whole day to make, to become like when he told let there be? Yeah, like is it took one full day to happen and come those things into existence? If not, if like if it happened just by a word, like if God spoke, let the water divide it. If it happened in instant, he would have told other thing like how we're telling day one, day two, all then mm. can be happened in one day. Okay. So now you want to hurry up even faster than that. <laughs> so one side people are stretching one day into billions of years. <laughs> <laughs> so your question is, why did God have to take one full day to do something? <laughs> did he? So the answer is, we don't know, right? Like, it just says that on such and such a day, God did such and such a thing. Now, did it take the whole day for what God spoke 
to actually come into thing? Did it take 12 hours of daylight to happen? Or did it take full 24 hours to happen? Or did it happen in an instant? Right? My thought would be it all happened in an instant. Right? And it happened in an instant. And it from that moment, it became a process. It became something that was set in place. You know, especially when you think about the vegetation and the these creatures, sea or the birds or the land. When God spoke, these things started happening. And from that time, it's continuing to happen. The earth is still giving vegetation, like you know, plants and things still keep happening. Uh, creatures are still being, you know, whether it's in the sea or in the air or on the land. Creatures are still being born, and it's just going on. So it began that instant, and it has continued as a process. It is continuing as a process till now. So um, to me, it doesn't matter that, uh, I would say, it, it all happened in an instant, but it continued, and it still continues happening as a process. Why did God select, you know, day one I'll do this, day two I'll do this, day three I'll do this, day four I'll do this, day five. Day... Why did God do that? It's because He's God. He just chose to do it that way. And again, we can say in all of that, He was giving us an example. He was going to set something in place for us, saying, six days you work, and then you rest on the seventh. If he finished everything on day one, he'll say, you work one day, rest six days. <laughs> that will be a reverse of the intent of what he wants for us, right? So I'm just trying to make some deductions. Uh, Pastor, when we are talking about this, all the creation and pre-Adamic uh, period, so when all these happened, like about this Lucifer story, and he, he got through this Lucifer down, and when it actually happened, maybe uh, after the creation of heavens and the earth, or after, before, or yeah. So, what do we know about Lucifer and the angels? Right. Uh, we know that they existed before man was there. Right. So, because. Uh, Man was on the earth, and then we see Satan appearing. That means Satan became Satan most likely before man was um, created, right? most likely. Did it happen during Genesis chapter 2? Uh, you know, because uh, it's very unlikely, because very short time. So it's probably, yeah, it happened somewhere before, right? Now, these angelic beings were created. They were created in the heaven. In heaven means where God dwells. So God didn't need the heavens and the earth. They were in heaven, in the dwelling place of God. And, uh, you know, when it talks about the, the glow in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, Talks about uh, you know what how uh, Lucifer was his glory and all of that. Um, it could have all been in heaven, you know. Uh, does it necessitate that there had to be a pre-Adamic life for Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28 for some of it to be? You know, does it necessitate? Not necessary, because a lot of it is very descriptive language, right? And especially in Isaiah 14, there is the dual reference. There is the reference to the physical king of the earth, the king of Tyre, as well as suddenly it changes to the angelic being, that is Lucifer. So there's a dual reference happening in the chapter where the prophet is going between the literal king on the earth and demonic power, which is Lucifer. You know. So some of these things which... Um, uh, necessitate or with the, have reference to the earth, we would say, okay, yeah, maybe it's referring to the natural king, 
it doesn't have to refer to Lucifer. You know, so all we can say is it happened sometime, most likely, uh, or I should say, we could with confidence say it happened before Adam came on the scene, sometime in the past. We say you know eternity past or dateless past that Lucifer led the rebellion. He was the archangel. He was a worshipping angel. Uh, he was created on glory and beauty as, as it described. And he led the rebellion. And then he was banished from heaven. And he tried to seek place on the earth. But the earth was given to Adam. And Adam handed it off to Satan. Because Satan said, it has been given to me. You know, so the earth was given to Adam, and it is through his disobedience he gained access here. So there is a lot that we don't know about Lucifer in you know what all happened in the past. Um, so I think it's better not to imagine too much, otherwise it'll be like you know, right? People writing fiction, we also writing <laughs> Bible fiction, <laughs> or I shouldn't call it Bible fiction, but things that. We're just imagining. Okay, online, Nina is saying his creative work was completed. And that's why God rested. It was totally effective, very good. Um, so, Nina, uh, is that, uh, I think you're asking a question is that, that, that God completed his work and that's why he rested? Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's, yeah. So is that a, is that a question? You're just sharing a comment, you know. Oh, it's a question. Um, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. So I think the question is. Um, his creative work was completed, question mark. And that's why God rested. Um, it was totally effective, very good. Um, would you re restate your question, Nina, so I can understand it? I, I didn't pick it up yet. Okay. Uh, the question had just come up, uh, Pastor, about the about why did God need to rest? So when I was just looking in Genesis two uh, and verses one and two, it kind of mentioned that that way. Thus, the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. Oh, that's uh, uh, NIV. Oh, the heavens and the mm -hmm. earth and all the host of them were finished, and on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had done. And he rested. So, and uh, one thirty-one, it kind of he saw that it was good and very good. So, can we kind of say that uh, what God wanted to do in this area, um, it was totally effective, very good, and uh, so in that way, rested to commemorate it. Can we say it that way? Or? Yeah. 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 That means God finished it. So it's okay. I've done all I, wa all I wanted to do. So let me pause or stop or rest. Yeah. That's fine. That's perfectly um, correct understanding as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. All right. Some more questions here? Uh, so is it like, um, you know, when you make a machine or something, you know, to see how it works, you step back, you let it work. So is it like that to see how it works? <laughs> so God saw everything was good. Everything's exactly the way he wanted it. And yeah, I was very happy. Yeah, yeah. because you see, like, you step back and you're very pleased with all that's happened. So pleased. is that why, like, you know, step back and see, you know, you see it stopped working. It means... He finished the process of the creation and everything, but everything else up there is still like minute things, you know, like, you know, when it comes to uh, birth and all other things like that. Those are all still like happening. They're all like small work, but when it comes to like a larger sense, he's finished this part. Yeah. So, like... yeah, uh, that's kind of what the Bible is saying that he, he finished whatever he wanted to do. Yeah. And he was very happy with it. Yeah. 
and he paused. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean he never started working. Yeah, no, no, he's still no. working. <laughs> God is at work, and you know now he's working in us, and he's got a lot of work to do in each of us. Yeah. Um. Uh. But yeah, he was very pleased. Said, yeah, that's a good. That's another way to look at it. Yeah. Question. Uh, so, passing in verse um, 90, okay, let's say verse 20. So, Adam gave names all cattle to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. So, um, so in this, so like some animals uh, can live only in like a particular place. Let's say a polar bear, for an example, can only live in the Arctic where it's really cold. So, what about those type of animals? Like, how did Adam? <laughs> how, how did Adam, Adam name those animals that live in some far off regions? Yeah. Um, so you know this is kind of kind of leads into our next lesson lesson number six about darwin's theory where we will see some things where uh see the way things are today are quite different from, the, from genesis chapter one and two what we do understand in genesis chapter one and two god spoke to the whole earth and uh, things were happening all over the earth at the same time like it didn't grass didn't grow only in eden it is growing all over the world uh sea creatures are coming not just you know somewhere in, near near eden it is it is happening so god speaking the whole earth is responding that means birds creatures everything was happening everywhere uh animals and everything but in the garden, the animals were brought. It doesn't mean that every animal ever created, right? But and it doesn't mean like all the sea fish and all, all lined up on the ground in front of Adam. No, they were all in the sea. They had to be in the sea, right? Uh, or the birds, they were all everywhere, right? So the understanding is that maybe a representation of these animals and creatures but uh, came before adam and adam was the one who gave them their whatever he wanted to call them or designate names for them but again you have to think there's so many kinds of creatures in the sea they didn't all start walking and coming to adam <laughs> what is my name <laughs> then go back <laughs> yeah that we are today, you know. Um, so I think uh, Genesis to twenty, the verse that you mentioned, yeah, Genesis, yeah, to twenty. It's it's indicating to us that Adam was given charge of the earth, and he is ascribing, designating names to all of creation, and. Uh, uh, how exactly it all happened we don't know right again we're, we're just using our imagination where perhaps adam was at that my, moment maybe god in, enabled adam supernaturally to comprehend every all of creation and designate names or even understand what names to give maybe god did it that way uh, but i can't imagine like all the sea creatures coming on the land lining up in front of adam <laughs> give me a name and going back to the sea all the birds you know how would actually happen we don't know but the implication of it we understand that adam is being put in charge of all creatures all creation on the earth that's the implication how exactly 220 genesis 220 actually happened we don't know uh, how it would have, you know, thing, and because it's it's hard to uh, what we know is when God created the whole earth was responding. It doesn't mean all these animals came in one place. It's not practical, right? So, how it actually happened, we don't know.
Sorry, Pastor. Uh, sir, what about dinosaurs? Yeah. So we'll come to one uh, a chapter. I think so. What okay. we're going to do is we're going to address. So what we'll get into now, and I just introduce it today, and we'll uh, develop this further. I just want to spend maybe this week and possibly next week on this whole creation part. We should finish it because there's a lot more to go ahead. But I'm, you know, I just wanted to understand Genesis chapters one and two because it's important. Um, what we have left in this whole creation side is. We have to respond to three sets of challenging challenges, questions that come from the scientific community to us as Christians, as believers. Okay. So one set is uh, the questions brought to us through evolutionary biology about how life came in on the earth. Okay. So it started with Darwin. Or I actually started before Darwin. We'll, when we go into the chapter, we'll see. Started actually before Darwin. Before Darwin, there were people who were, they didn't, and this was Darwin was, you know, 1800. So we're almost talking about 200 years ago, almost, where they did not have as much scientific technique as we have today. Today, yeah, we have lots of, you know, you can have microscope, you can do research, you can do all that. Those days, they didn't have all those things, right? And before Darwin, so we're talking even before 1800s. There were people who were coming up with ideas or theories that maybe God didn't create, but things may have just happened, just evolved. Okay. But it was Darwin, and we, when we get into chapter 6, we'll, we'll understand. It was Darwin who kind of gave it some uh, uh, a, a, a more clear uh, say more explanation and he made it more widely known through his writings so that's why many people call darwin as the father of modern evolution theory refer to darwin but actually those ideas were floating around even before that you know still thinking maybe it just happened maybe it just it just change 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 you know okay, okay. and then today uh, the scientific community, evolutionary budget, people have studied, people study, so, so much our knowledge is there. So there are questions from evolutionary biology. How do we respond to that? That's one side. Second side is cosmology. That means, like we said, the Big Bang. So we need to understand a little bit about what they are saying in Big Bang, how everything started from some point in time, in the past, there was nothing. And suddenly, uh, somehow, energy uh, and mass just exploded from a single point, exploded. And over billions and billions and billions of years, you know, planets and stars and all this thing came into existence. So we try to understand what they are saying. And then how do we respond to that? And then the last is, what like what Sean asked, is questions about findings today, especially in uh, carbon dating and uh, with the finding of fossils, right? They say, look, we are using scientific technique, and this is telling us this has been here on, like Earth is 4 billion years. And then they find other things. OK, this has been here. So many hundred thousand years. This has been here so many things. That star is so many billions of years old. The universe is 14 billion years old. You know? So how do we respond to those things? Right? So three categories of challenges that we face from the scientific community. Right. So today I'll just introduce uh, Darwin's, like his history. Then we'll get into, OK, what was his theory? How do we respond to it? What are the gaps in his theory? Like, what are the mistakes he made? And then we'll you know, do that. We'll try to finish this uh, hopefully next week, and so on. OK, let's get started. Let's see if we can, how much we can do today. All right. So let's go to num chap lesson number six, right? Uh, so modern evolution theory. 
right? So now very uh, interesting is what has happened. What has happened over time is the uh, evolution theory tried to explain from a biology perspective. Then before Darwin finished his work, he extended that into trying to explain even the evolution of emotions. Ah, so not only biology, that is, uh, the species are evolving, but with that, he tried to kind of extend it into psychology. The mind is also evolving. So he ex tried to ex explain that, trying to explain the behavior of animals and the evolution of you know, animal behavior to human behavior. So he extended it. And then over time, this has been extended into social and cultural evolution. That means, why is the change in society and the change in culture, you know, that is also trying to uh, being explained with the same idea of evolution, you know. So, okay, before people were living like tribals, then that was a certain social structure and culture. Now we are coming into cities. In cities, also things are changing so much. Society and culture is evolving. You know, uh, things are changing so much. So this whole idea of evolution uh, started there with biology, then has been extended to so many, like to psychology, to so social and cultural behavior, and so on. So uh, people are trying to explain everything on everything based on this evolution. Now, it looks when we talk, when you look at social evolution, cultural evolution, uh, it looks very uh, real. Yeah, we understand, we can see even in our, our own time how things are changing around us. You know, life in the city, you know, how it was, I don't know, a couple of decades ago and how things are changing. And even now things are changing the way society and culture and so on and so forth. We know it's changing. But is it, and so we say it's evolving or it's changing, but does it always mean it's getting better? Or, you know, uh, is it a movement up? Is it, or is it sometimes a decline, actually? It's getting worse. It's going better. It's probably getting worse. So those things are debatable, right? Anyway, so Charles Darwin, let's just give some introduction before we finish today. So back in the 1800s, right, he was an English naturalist, and basically he studied natural things, uh, species of life, and so on. And then he... His main theory, he referred to it as a theory of descent, uh, or we could say how things came into being through variation and selection. That means variation means things keep on varying, you know, as, as there is a, a reproduction. They keep varying, right? It's not the same thing. There are variations happening. And there is selection. That means there's adaptation. And oh, certain things survive, certain things are eliminated. Right? So through the process of variation and selection, things keep getting, uh, have come to where it is today. Right? There's progressed uh, to where it is today. Um, his During his time, remember, we're going back 200 years. Yeah, in 1800s, his hypothesis was, and he based his ideas, his conclusions on four, mainly four observations. One was the geographic distribution of species. Why are polar bears only there? <laughs> you don't find polar bears roaming around in India. You know? I mean, we have bears, but it's a different kind of bear. Uh, uh, you know, why are bears found? Okay, so he was looking at, you know, why are certain creatures here, certain creatures there, certain creatures there? Like he was just observing 
but he came to these conclusions. So one was the distribution of different kinds of animals and birds and species. Second was based on fossils, whatever they could find in those times. Third was on based on vestigial organs. So I'm saying there are some organs that actually have no use. Then he said, okay, then maybe this, this species evolved to the place where that was no longer needed. And so, you know, it's a vestigial organ. It's not playing much of a important, but therefore he arrived, you know, used that as a basis of his conclusion. And uh, homology, okay, there are uh, similar uh, organs or similar um, parts playing different functions. Some can be used to fly, some can be used to swim, you know, different, they look, you know, like arms, you know, what birds have for flying, others have to swim. So he was looking at structures that seemed similar, but they used for different purpose. Okay. So he used that as, so he used these four things, four observations as a basis for his theory. Okay, so those days. Now, of course, they did not have as much, like I mentioned, as much scientific instrumentation, those kinds of things to validate what he was saying. Right? But based on what was available to him, observations he could make 200 years ago, he did that, and then he started arriving at a lot of theories, a lot of ideas. Just a little bit about, um, uh, okay, we'll talk a little bit about this background, but um, evolutionary biology, basically, so evolution, we come to where things are today. Uh, a modern biologist will say, okay, every organism, every living organism has some sort of a biochemical metabolism. That is, something is happening inside. There's a chemistry that is going on inside the living organism that's causing it to live. Second, every living organism has the ability to transmit information, reproduce itself, and it's transmitting information. And third, what comes out, the descendant, may be different from the parent because of uh, mutation, things that happen. So that gives rise to variety, variation, okay? So three things. If you say something is living, there are three characteristics. One is things are happening inside. There are reactions, chemical reactions that are, that are going on inside the living organism. Second, the organism has the ability to, to transmit information and third, it's reproducing itself, but what it reproduces could be slightly different from the original. Some variation will be there. Right? So say, okay, these are living things, fine. But two simple questions. One is, yeah, we today we have studied, we know that this information is being passed through what we refer to as the genes. But genes are basically, we studied further and we found out these are just, you know, lipids or proteins. They're all made up of some chemical molecules there. Somehow, these genes, the arrangement of these chemical molecules are so intelligent, they're giving rise to people like you and me. Oh, so you just, Take some chemicals, shake them nicely in a tube. Will you get a human being? You won't get a human being. So we are saying, see, we have studied everything so much. We know in the cell, it's, it's just actually some chemical compounds are there. Going down to the level of the genes, they're just chemical compounds. 
that are arranged in certain way. But that is driving life. That is dry, that is get the result of that is people like you and me. I mean, I'm just referring to people, and but it's you know, you can study all other living organisms. The very lowest level, it says compounds, chemical compounds. Whether you study a plant or you study a any creature, living organism, it says compounds, chemical compounds. They are arranged in such an important, in a, you know, okay, sequential way. It's arranged. So our question is, where did this intelligence come from? First of all, to arrange all these things like this, for it to keep on happening. And then it is giving rise to such wonderful <laughs> creatures. We can say man or any other creature you want. Right? Where did this intelligence come from? And uh, so the next big question is, you know, how could this all have started by a random Act. So we are just saying uh, there were these com chemical compounds, they randomly came together and produced such wonderful life. So, how come? So, that's the second big question. If life originated in such an extraordinary moment of absolute randomness, Causing transition from prebiotic to biotic evolution. That was before life, suddenly, before there was no life, suddenly life came. Same compounds. Suddenly life came. Yeah, same compounds. Prebiotic. And now it is a biotic evolution. How did a set of chemical compounds self organize? Into a self replicating system of macro molecules. Like, how come you just had some compounds, chemical compounds? How did they all form, come together in such intelligence? And then they started, you know, replicating, and, you know, suddenly you and I came. How could that be? You know, so where did the intelligence come from, and how could just these things just come together and transition from no life to life? Even if you assume, first of all, how did the compounds come into existence? So we're assuming these things were there, carbon molecules. So that goes back to the Big Bang theory that uh, the Big Bang happened, and they that has the Big Bang will have an explanation of how these molecules came into existence. We will see it in the next lesson. So Big Bang says, okay, somehow these molecules came, somehow they landed on the Earth, somehow there was all these compounds formed over time. And then, how did they all arrange themselves? Then how did they go from non-life to life? Okay. So, these are two big questions. Now, where did the intelligence come that these could arrange themselves so beautifully? And then how could it go from non-life to life? So evolutionary biology is trying to explain all these things, but we have two simple questions. Okay. All right. Let's just give a little background to Darwin and then we will pause. So actually very interesting about Darwin. He was actually raised in a church background, right? And uh, he was sent to study medicine. He couldn't, he didn't study, he, he neglected it. So he was sent actually to become a preacher, pastor. Right? So he was sent to Cambridge to do a BA to become an Anglican pastor. So that was his background. So he had some exposure to the Bible and all that. And then, he had a close friend who was a professor, botany professor, who encouraged him in his uh, desire to explore nature and so on and so forth. 
And so what happened is he, after he finished his uh, bachelor's, he went on a voyage uh, on, H uh, on, a, on a ship, HMS Beagle. Uh, he went through South America, the Galapagos Islands, uh, uh, in uh, kind of Central uh, South Central America, South America. Through went through Australia, South Africa, and so on. And so he was seeing all these different kinds of animals and so on. So he was studying all this, and he wrote everything down. He he published his first journal of his experience on his voyage that made him very famous. Okay, people of course like to read, you know, you've traveled to all these places, uh, what did you see, what was this? So it was a good thing, you know, so he, he wrote these things. But all of that, you know, so collecting all that knowledge and started thinking about it and uh, looking at the wildlife, the fossils that he saw collected, he came up with this theory of natural selection that was uh, around the age of 29 uh, that and we will we'll talk about this later how things may have how all these species that he sees in different islands different places okay this is how it would have happened so he came up with the theory trying to you know in some way respond to why are these things in different places and so on and he continued work on that later on around when he was about 50 years old, he published his major book on the origin of species, which was that one book that, um, you know, really tried to propound or promote the theory of evolution, right? the origin of species. Then he wrote uh, the other books, The Descent of Man uh, and uh, Selection, that's 1871. And then he tried to extend that to, like we said, to psychology, the expression of emotions in man and animals. So what he had observed um, in, in biology is now extending it into the area of psychology. And then he also looked at it, his last book, uh, on the power of movement in plants. Let me just make a few more thoughts, mention, and we go. So, uh, so like we said, Actually, there were people before Darwin who were thinking like this. So um, he was influenced, for example, by his grandfather, who also had these evolutionary ideas. Uh, so he could have picked that up and you know tried to expand on it. Um, there were he was also influenced um, by the reading of um, uh, another person's writing, Ma Malthus, on um, on how Malthus was. You know, trying to he was trying to explain, you know, uh, why people survive, why animals, plants survive, and he was coming up with theory on, you know, why some are preserved, why some are destroyed, and so on. So he was trying to explain. So these all these thoughts, you know, these ideas that he had picked up uh, became the basis of uh, became a big influence for the basis of things he uh, put out. But what we must also mention is that actually Darwin put out his theory as an argument against the Bible. So he was actually fighting against the Bible. So he, he was not putting necessarily ideas out saying, I have made a scientific discovery. His writings, the way he wrote it was, I am trying to prove the Bible wrong. So in one sense, he was actually his book was actually trying an attempt to disprove the creation account of the Bible, uh, which was very clear in the way he wrote. And we will see, we'll have some quotes. Um, uh, Darwin's writings pre predominantly argue against uh, creator. So he's, he's trying to position that, uh, his writings and his theories and his ideas to try and disprove um, uh, the creation, creation account of scripture. Okay, so we'll pause here. So what we next week? I, I really want to finish this. We will go to Darwin's theory. Theory. We'll go through the Big Bang theory, like what, and we'll try to respond. You know, what are the, some of the gaps in Darwin's theory, so that at least when somebody comes and says, "Oh, I believe in evolution," we can respond to it.
Uh, I believe in Darwin's theory, we can respond to it. At least ask some questions. Same thing with Big Bang, we can ask some questions. And then, you know, the, the last part about dating and fossil, the fossil uh, uh, carbon dating and the life of fossils, okay? So let's pause here, let's um, close in prayer and uh, we'll wrap this up next week, okay? May I request somebody to please pray? You can take the mic and pray. And Heavenly Father, thank you very much for guiding us all here for this prayer, and if, uh, for this uh, understanding of word, Heavenly Father, and to know more about your creation, Heavenly Father. Uh, please give us the knowledge, Heavenly Father, to retain all that we learn here, Heavenly Father, and thank you very much for what we've done so far, Heavenly Father. And bless each person present here, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.